Welcome back to chapter 14 in the final chapter that we will be looking at this year. This chapter is about inference for regression. Way back in the beginning of the year, we learned how to find a regression line. The whole y hat equals a plus bx thing. Um, we'd plug it into our calculator. The calculator would do most of it. Uh, it's a least square regression line. But that was how we found the model to model our data that we graphed in a scatter plot. Well, as we've been working throughout the past few chapters, the data is just the statistic and it helps to explain what we think the population parameter is, but it doesn't give us that precise thing. And that's also true about the regression line. So this chapter, we're going to be looking at doing some inference, some confidence intervals and tests about that regression line. So looking at um, the inference about the model specifically, if we remember our model, it was just y hat equals a plus bx. Well, that is the model. That's the statistic. We have a parameter as well. The true regression line, so the population, like what's actually there, is going to be mu of y, so that's the mean of y, is going to be alpha plus beta x. Remember when we deal with our population parameters, a lot of times those are going to be Greek letters because who knows what the actual population value is? I don't know, Zeus knows. So there we go. Um, so we are looking at the... Um, the true regression line. Before we get into how to actually find these things, let's look at some conditions for being able to do some inference about a model. So our conditions, we have for any value of x, response y varies normally, and they're independent of each other. So the independent of each other is going to be kind of like getting that SRS, making sure we're actually having individual values. Um, now the the response y for each x is going to vary normally. Um, that we actually saw on that title screen graphic. Uh, I'll pull it up again in just a minute, uh, but we'll see what it is, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about it there, maybe even give you a poorly drawn sketch. Uh, the mean response mu of y has a straight line relationship with x, which is this line that we talked about, mu of y equals alpha plus beta x. So if the true relationship is not linear, trying to fit a line to the relationship is probably not going to be very effective. So this is just saying that the true relationship does actually need to be linear. Um, and then the standard deviation of y, sigma, uh, is the same for all x, and sigma is unknown. Like, we're not going to know sigma. Like, very rarely do we actually know the standard deviation. Um, we saw that with z-tests, which act works when we're dealing with proportions, but that's kind of just a stepping stone. Usually we don't really know sigma, so we don't even bother doing that here. So, that that initial graphic, that the, the normal response about the mean. So for any value of x here, we have a value of x, the points are going to have this normal distribution. So if we look at x, we're going to have a bunch of points kind of close to where the line is, and then a few kind of going away a little bit. So if we were looking at, say, just a graph, and we have our regression line. Our points, we're going to have a bunch of points kind of around the line at any given point. And as we get further away from the line, we're going to have fewer and fewer points. This is the poorly drawn thing I was showing you, um, or I was telling you about. And so then that's what these are showing. So if we get this x value, these points right here associated with this x value, we're going to have a bunch of them kind of close to the line and then a few of them further and further off as we go. Um, so that's what that condition's talking about. Um, there's another condition 
around somewhere that we're going to see where the standard deviation is going to be the same for each value of x. And all that means is that when we have our line, it's going to be, they're, they're all going to be about the same spread out. We're not going to have points where we have, like they're really close here, and then they start getting further and further away the further we get away from like x equals zero. They're, it's going to kind of stay consistent. Now, keeping that in mind, how many data points do you have to get to really, really check that? That's a ton of data points. So this is one of those things where we look at it and, it's, and the answer isn't so much that it is this and it meets the condition. The answer is more that it's not clearly deviant from the condition. Like it's not clearly non-normal, so we'll go ahead and use what it is that we're using. It's gonna be the same kind of thing for this because in order to really check it, you'd have to have a bunch of Y values for every X value. And that just generally doesn't happen um, that much. Uh, so um, we have a standard error because we have standard deviation well, that's great, except we don't know it. So instead of standard deviation, we're going to use a standard error about the least square line, which is going to go by S. And it's going to be the square root of 1 over n minus 2 times the sum of the residuals squared. Now, this is very similar to the standard deviation equations, um, where we'd have the x minus x bar squared. That's what the residuals are, except it's y minus y hat. Remember, the residuals are the distance between the point and the line at that given x value. And so that's what this is doing. It takes them all, it squares them. Because if you didn't square them and you added them all together, the positive ones and negative ones are going to cancel each other out and you're going to come up with something that's basically zero pretty much every time. Um, so we square them to make them all positive. We add them all together, divide by n minus 2. A lot of times it's been n minus 1. Now it's n minus 2. That's going to change our degree of freedom as well, by the way. Um, and then we square root to get rid of that squared that we had to do. So looking at some confidence or con yeah, confidence intervals and significance tests. Uh, we have two different variables here that we're looking at. We have a y-intercept and the slope. The y-intercept is that a or alpha, if it's talking about the population, and the slope is going to be b or beta. Now, luckily, we don't generally do confidence intervals or tests with both of these because what happens is if we have two lines let's say they have the same slope but they have slightly different y-intercepts does that really change the prediction all that much not really. I mean, you're going to be a little bit, a little bit off on each of your values, but it stays consistent and it's basically the same. However, if you have two lines that have the same y-intercept, but slightly different slopes, all of a sudden, these distances are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it turns out that the y-intercept, little changes in that don't make much of a difference. However, little changes in the slope do. And so when we're finding this stuff, we don't find confidence intervals and tests about the y-intercept. There are ways of doing it, but it's not covered in our course. We're going to be looking specifically at the slope. So we have confidence intervals for the regression slope. Remember, a confidence interval is going to be our estimate, plus or minus, a t star, because it's, a, it's t, we don't know the uh, population standard deviation, then times the standard error. And so our estimate is that b value that we found when we did our regression plus or minus t star times standard error of b. 
you might be saying to yourself, self, I have to say that, make sure I'm paying attention, self, what is the standard error of B? I am very glad you asked that question because the standard error of B is going to be S, the same S we just found, the standard error of mu of y hat um, over the square root of the sum of x minus x bar squared. So if you remember the S, that was a big square root of 1 over n minus 2 times the sum of y minus y hat squared. So the standard error of the slope, I didn't have this all put together like this. Um, I knew there was a reason I wanted to. 1 over n minus 2, and then we have sigma y minus y hat squared over sigma x minus x bar squared. We have change of y over change of x. That's the slope. And so it should make sense that the standard error of the slope is going to include slope-like calculations in it. Um, but that's, that's what it is. Um, so that's the confidence interval for the regression slope. Um, it's just B is going to be between those two values. Hopefully those values are close. Um, but those same rules apply. The, the closer we get our, the, the higher we get our confidence, the bigger that interval is going to be. The lower we get our confidence, the smaller the interval is going to be, but our confidence is super low. So um, it's, it's that, that game to try and get a good confidence with a small interval. And generally speaking, even with these, we use a 95% confidence interval most of the time. Again, that's just kind of standard procedure. Um, we have hypothesis tests as well. Uh, for our hypothesis test for a slope, it's really just the test of no linear relationship. Does the, our data have a linear relationship or does it not have a linear relationship? And so that's the test that we use. The null hypothesis is beta equals zero. Remember the null hi the hypotheses are always using the population parameters. So we use beta, not B. We know what B is. But B is based off of our sample. We're trying to say something about the population. So null hypothesis, beta equals zero. That would be no linear relationship. Um, your alternative hypothesis, you could have not equal zero, which means it does have a linear relationship, or you could have greater than zero, less than zero, which would be either a positive or negative relationship, respectively. Um, so how do we find these? Our t value, remember the t is going to be the observed minus predicted. It was always like x minus x bar over um, the standard error. Well, our predicted or our null hypothesis is zero, so the value of t is just b over the standard error of b. Same thing we found right up here. So once you have your confidence interval stuff, you could do your hypothesis test as well. Um, and then the degree of freedom is n minus two because each of the points actually has two points, and so it ends up with n minus two for our degree of freedom. Um, so I gave you a whole bunch of equations here. All of them are in your formula sheet. They're all in your book. I mean, honestly, formula sheets don't really make much of a difference here. Um, but really, everything that we're doing here, you can find this all in your calculator as well. Um, generally speaking, we don't tend to do this stuff by hand. It's done in the calculator or using computer software. Um, and that'll be true for the bigger equations we're going to see in section two. Um, yes, there are bigger equations in section two. Uh, but again, they're generally done with your calculator. In the same spot, confidence interval, there's going to be a confidence interval for the slope. Um, and you can find those. There's instructions in your book, which I'm sure that you're reading because I've asked you that of you and told you that's an expectation. So I'm sure that you're doing it. Um, but the equations are here as well in case you needed them. Section two, we're looking at predictions and conditions. Um, or yes, predictions and conditions. So we have two different types of predictions. We have a prediction for a mean response. That would be if 
we have a, uh, if we're say measuring shoe size and height, and we're using shoe size to predict height. If we have a shoe size of 11, the mean height is predicted to be blank. So let's say 510. That's the mean height. That's a mean response. And so for that, we use a confidence interval for the mean response. That mu of y is equal to alpha plus beta times x star, where x star is just a specific value of x. That would be like the size 11 shoe. Like we're looking specifically for that value. What are we predicting y to be? Or in this case, the mean y. And so the confidence interval for a mean response, confidence intervals, remember, it's the predicted plus or minus t star times the standard error. So the predicted is y hat. That's our predicted value. It's from our model. Um, equals t star times the standard error of mu hat. That would be the standard error of our mean responses. That arrow was completely the wrong direction here. Let's try that again. The standard error of the mean responses it still wasn't particularly good. I don't know why I can't put an arrow there. Um, and so what is the standard error of the mean responses? That's not the standard error of the Ys. That was different. And so, well, the standard error of the mean responses is going to be S. That's that same S we saw earlier times the square root of 1 over N plus I know there's a plus in there. It's kind of weird. Um, X star minus X bar squared. X star is one specific value. That's the value that we are looking for. A size 11 shoe. Minus the mean shoe size. 9.75 squared. That gives us one single value. As opposed to the denominator here, we have the sum. And so here we have to plug in all the x's minus the x bars, square them, and add them together. Um, so, but again, calculator or computer technology does that for you. You don't have to do that by yourself, generally speaking. And even if it, there isn't a thing plugged into the calculator, you can do that using your list features. Um, like you would not do that all by hand, especially since chances are there would be a lot of data points. So that's for the mean response. If we have a size 11 shoe, what is the mean height of people that have that shoe size? This is what we predict based on our model. An individual response. If we get someone with the size 11 shoe, what will their height be? So it's not the mean. It's going to have a lot more variation to it because taking different individuals with the same shoe size, we're going to get different heights. So for this, we use a prediction interval. I called it a confidence interval here. It's a prediction interval. Sorry, that's a that's a vocab word there. Prediction interval. Um, what is a prediction interval, you might ask? It's basically the same thing as a confidence interval, um, but it's for an individual response instead of the mean response. Um, but we do it for y. It's the same value. It's just not the mean of y now. So here I got it right. Prediction interval for a single observation of y. It's still the estimate plus or minus t star times the standard error. The estimate's still y hat. t star is still going to be the same t star based on your confidence level that you want. Um, it's just now the standard error of y hat instead of mu hat. It should really probably be mu of mu hat of y. Yeah, that it. A lot of other things in there could go in there. Um, so now the standard error of y hat, again, being that it is a individual response instead of a mean response, it's going to have a bit more. Um, it's going to have a bit more variation. So the standard error is going to be just a bit bigger. And so um, our standard error of y hat actually is very similar to the standard error of mu hat, thankfully. There's just this extra little one right in there. That's the only difference. So you have the standard of error of mu hat, add one before you square root it, and then multiply by that s on the outside. Um, 
so those are the two different kinds of predictions we have. We have the mean response, we have the individual response. We also have some conditions, and these conditions are going to be basically the same as the conditions we saw in section one, by the way. The observations are independent. Again, that's the same idea as an SRS. The true relationship is linear. If we're trying to fit a line to something that's not actually linear, it's we're not going to get good results. That's just not going to work. And remember, you can check the linearity of your data um, and how well it matches the line by making a regression plot. So plot your residual or your residual plot. Plot those residuals. See, is it scattered evenly about the line? And that helps check for the next couple as well. The standard deviation is uh, about the line is the same everywhere, which means that it's not spreading out or getting closer like we saw in my poorly drawn graph way back in the beginning and the responses vary normally about the true regression line so those are things that you can look at and see a bit better on a residual plot than you can by just looking at the regular graph with the line going through it are most of the values clustered around the residual line and getting sparser and sparser as you get away from the line um, that's what you're looking at there. So this was the end of chapter 14. This was the very last stuff. Um, we will be having a chapter 13, 14 test coming up at the end of the week. Um, and other than that, though, read your book, keep working problems, keep asking questions, and as always, Happy mathing.